Okay, uh, so thanks everybody for making it out uh, to the, the first seminar of this semester. Um, today we have uh, Sebi Chauba from the University of Delaware, um, who will be talking to us about addressing graphs and hypergraphs. Go ahead and take us away. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for, uh, for coming to the talk on, uh, on Friday afternoon. So I will talk about um, some uh, uh, recent and not so recent uh, uh, problems regarding addressing of, of graphs and, and hypergraphs. Um, so the story starts at uh, Bell Labs in the, in the 1970s. And this is a quote from an interview uh, with Henry Pollack in which he described uh, working on this loop switching problem. And essentially it boils down to our boss, John Pierce came to us and I've invented this new system and see if you can figure out how to, how to, make, it, how to make it work. Um, so this talks that you see there, they're, they're talking about this loop switching uh, problem. Uh, so what was the loop switching problem? This was in, uh, so this, they describe it in, um, in this paper in the Bell System Technical Journal in, in 1971, and uh, uh, you know this is a, a snapshot from uh, from that paper, and uh, you can find a you know the description is pretty well, pretty good in, in in that paper. You can find a, also a description in uh, Mike Tate's uh, master thesis. He he read that uh, that paper uh, thoroughly and described what's going on. So they talk about transferring information in the, in a network and. Uh, Essentially, I, I have here pictures from their paper. Uh, the loop switching is about, uh, you have these loops, these, these circles, and the message goes on one of these loops, then it touches another loop, so it means it transfers to that, uh, to, to the other loop. Uh, and you want it, to, they're talking about a way of sending uh, messages around that could find their shortest path from one node to, to the other. Uh, just by kind of like using the addresses or the labelings of, of the vertices. So in this situation, if you look at this graph in which the vertices are those uh, four circles adjacent if they touch, um, you can the graph is essentially a cycle C4, and you can label the vertices with these words over the alphabet uh, 0, 1, such that uh, the distance in the graph between any two nodes equals the Hamming distance between any two any two labels, any two addresses. And therefore, if you have this situation, uh, even in a larger graph, it's, it's, uh, it's very easy to, to send, uh, you know, to figure out the shortest path from one node to the other, just by looking at, uh, at their addresses, you kind of make sure the address uh, um, decreases, the distance between the addresses decreases as you, as you go along. So, you know, for, it, it works for, for this graph for C4, uh, but, uh, you know, they describe other graphs. So for example, this one in which you have, uh, you have six nodes. And here the problem is with a, with a triangle or with the C5, but with a triangle is easiest to, to figure out. It's, it's actually, it's impossible to find, uh, to, to give the vertices of a, of a triangle um, addresses as words over the alphabet zero one uh, of, of any length such that the distance between any two any two vertices uh, equals the Hamming distance between their labels. So the solutions that they came up with, and uh, this, you know, I, I give you here their solution. Uh, it's uh, introduce a new letter in this in this situation in their in, the, in their uh, Bell System Journal paper. They denote it by D. Later on, we'll see it is, is denoted by star, uh, such that. Uh, so-called now we label the vertices by words of the same length over the um, the alphabet 0 1 D such that uh, we want now that the distance in the graph between any two vertices to equal the number of uh, positions in which uh, one one uh, the label of or the address of one vertex is zero and the other one is one so that D could could be at the same time both a zero and one doesn't contribute to the to this, uh, to this uh, measuring this uh, so-called distance between the labels. So I call it so-called distance between the labels because this is not a metric. This one over this alphabet zero one star, it's, uh, it's not a metric in general. So now, for example, if you look at the vertices, um, um, let me see what I have there, A and B, in the graph, the distance is two, you can go A, E, B, 
and uh, number of positions uh, where one uh, uh, vertex has zero and the other one is one uh, is exactly two. They differ in the, the first two positions. The D later on, they do not contribute anything. Okay. Um, now, later on, they introduced uh, the notation instead of D, they have a paper around the same time in 1972. Uh, it's called on embedding and graphs in squash cubes. And I'll tell you a bit later about what does this problem have to do with squash cubes, in which they, uh, you know, they describe this uh, this labeling, and the D is replaced, as you see, by star over there in the in the first in the first line. Okay. Um, so again, to kind of summarize, the problem is the following: I give you a graph G. You want to find a function, so from the vertex set, so you want to label each each vertex by words of the same length, let's say K over the alphabet zero one star, such that the distance in the graph, which I denote on the left by dg of x, y, in so the, the length of the shortest path between x and y, equals the number of positions j, where the label of one vertex is zero and the label of the other vertex is one. Um, and the interest would be in, in minimizing this k. So I, didn't, I denote by n of g, the minimum k such that this is possible. For uh, I had. I haven't shown that such a K exists. I'll, I'll, I'll do that in, in a second. But for now, this is uh, essentially the problem that, uh, that they were studying. And I give you some examples uh, there copied from various places. So the first one is the cube, where you can do it with just zero ones. Uh, you know, that's the three dimensional cube in which you can address everything with uh, words of uh, uh, length three, and that's best possible. And then the triangle that we were talking about a bit uh, earlier, uh, you can label it with the words of length uh, of length two. You have the one on the left, one, 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 zero on the top, and zero star on the right. And again, you can check that between any two vertices, the distance obviously is one, and the number of positions in which uh, one has a zero and the other one has a one is exactly one. And then a larger graph uh, over there on uh, five vertices in which uh, you, know, you have this, uh, an addressing with words of, uh, of, length, uh, of length three. Okay. Now, I should point out that, and I will mention it a bit later, uh, uh, kind of a reformulation of this parameter n of g. It's not known if this determining this parameter is NP-hard or not. There's a relation now, which I'll mention about of this uh, parameter of G with uh, biclic decomposition of certain certain uh, multigraphs, uh, but again, uh, yeah, I I don't know if uh, this determine this parameter. I believe it should be it's NPR, but I haven't seen any proof. Nobody has proved uh, a reduction of it. Okay. Um, so yeah, so let me explain the the equivalence between addressing uh, graphs and uh, biclic partitions. So by a biclic, I mean a complete bipartite subgraph. So let's say we have, we take the distance uh, multigraph of our graph G. So uh, we have a graph G and the distance multigraph is gonna have the same, uh, the same vertex set and the multiplicity of an edge X, Y is gonna be the distance in the graph between X and Y. So on the diagonal, you're going to have distance zero, so you get zero. Um, when, wherever you had an edge before, the distance between those two vertices is, is one. So that stays as a one. Um, and you know, if you have uh, larger distances of two, three, and so on, in this distance multigraph, you will have larger numbers. But in particular, for the complete graph, the distance multigraph of the complete graph is the same thing as the complete graph. Now. What I want to convince you here, give you a sketch, is that the addressing of a graph G, so this uh, representation, uh, this addressing function F from the vertex set of G to words of the same length K over the alphabet zero one star with the property that we mentioned earlier, uh, is equivalent to a partition of the edge, let's call it set, but it's an edge multiset of the, of the distance multigraph into complete bipartite uh, subgraphs by clicks. And the partition goes as, as is described there. If I have a biclic partition, um, so I denote the parts, the you know the partite sets or color classes of this of these complete bipartite subgraphs, I denote them by uh, a1b1 and so on, akbk. If I have such a partition, 
Then I uh, give uh, the vertex X, the address FX, uh, which has, uh, uh, it's a word of length K over the alphabet zero one star, where the position J in that, in that word is a zero if X belongs to AJ, is one if X belongs to BJ, and it's zero otherwise. So that's the, and one can check that that's gonna be a valid addressing and the number of positions, uh, it's gonna satisfy that property that the distance uh, between the uh, between two any two vertices equals the number of positions j where fx has a, uh, fx and f y j are are different and one is a zero and one is a one. I mean, this doesn't actually you know the, you can do this actually uh, for any matrix. So any uh, non-negative uh, integer matrix you can uh, you can play kind of a little bit this. Uh, this this game and I think it's it's way to describe something like this is in general is described for um, in a paper by uh, Fan Chang, Ron Graham, Peter Winkler uh, when they talk about directed uh, addressing directed graphs. Okay, um, all right. So what I wrote before, it's essentially you know it appears in the Graham Pollock work and it was it's rephrased in the kind of uh, it's an equivalent in an. Uh, it's an equivalent form of that, uh, of what I described before, uh, uh, appears in a matrix equation form. And in the Graham and Pollock paper, one of the papers they attributed to another article which appeared in a Bell Systems journal. And uh, it, it's not very difficult. I mean, perhaps if you see it first time, you may be, it, it may be a little bit uh, um, uh, too much notation and so on, but it's, these things are, are fairly straightforward to see that uh, if you have a, this biclic partition of, uh, of D here, I, I use D both for the distance multigraph and for the distance matrix uh, of, of the graph. Uh, if you have this biclic partition of this distance multigraph and you put the A's, the characteristic vectors of A1, A2, AK, you put them in this tall matrix X. So it's an N by K matrix. And the characteristic vectors of the, the other parts, B1, BK, you put them in the matrix Y. Um, then uh, the fact that you have a partition is you know, it's, it's equivalent with D equals X, Y transpose plus Y, X transpose. Okay, so uh, why is that uh, useful? Well, it's useful because you can actually get a lower bound on K, which is pretty much the benchmark for most of the problems from, that we'll see from now on. And the argument to, so I would like to, you know, say something about K from this matrix uh, equation um, goes as follows. So I'll sketch it over there. Uh, so if, let's take W uh, a vector. So I, for me, vectors are columns. So uh, it's, in the, it's in the orthogonal complement of the column space of X. So that means that W is perpendicular on, um, on uh, on everything uh, you know in the in the column of x, so that means that uh, w transpose x is going to be zero. So when I do the calculation w transpose d w, this is going to give me w transpose x y transpose w plus uh, w transpose y x transpose w, and this W transpose kills the first term on the left hand side here. This is going to be zero, and it kills the second term on the on the right side because this is going to be zero. And so you get this uh, fact that W transpose uh, d um, uh, W equals zero, and that means that W does not belong to the e plus of d, which I denote by that the uh, the um, the subspace, which is spanned by all eigenvectors corresponding to, to positive eigenvalues of D. Because if you are a linear combination, if you are a linear combination, uh, let's say W is non-zero. So if, if you are a non-zero vector, which is a linear combination of, uh, of uh, vectors uh, corresponding to, to positive eigenvalues, then when you uh, plug this uh, W into W transpose DW, you're going to get a positive quantity. So that's, that basically proves that last part. So essentially, the goal of the first line is to, to state the second line, to prove the second line, which is that the orthogonal complement of the column of x and this, uh, this uh, subspace spanned by all these 
positive eigenvectors is just a trivial intersection. And therefore, if we take a dimension of the whole space, it's gonna be bigger than the, than the sum of the dimensions of these two, two subspaces. And the dimension, the, the matrix X was N by K. So the dimension of the orthogonal complement of its column space is at least N minus K. And so from this argument, one gets that K must be bigger than the, di the dimension of this subspace spanned by all the positive eigenvectors, which is N plus D, which is the same thing as the number of positive eigenvalues of D uh, taken with multiplicity, okay? And by a similar argument, you, you can basically just replace uh, plus with minus in this uh, subscript. You can prove that K is bigger than, uh, than N, N, uh, N minus D. And so what does it give? It gives this result, which again, Graham and Pollock, they give a proof, but they also attribute it to uh, Witzenhausen. Uh, there's no reference there. And they say that uh, basically, if uh, you have a graph with distance multigraph slash matrix D, then this parameter n of g uh, that I mentioned uh, in a, uh, from the beginning is greater or equal than the maximum between the number of positive and negative eigenvalues of d. Okay, so yeah, that's a interesting connection between a kind of again a purely combinatorial parameter on the left hand side and this uh, this um, uh, spectral algebraic parameter on the right hand side. Okay, um, all right. So what else did Graham and Pollock do? Well, they look at the uh, obvious uh, suspects for graphs. So if you look at the complete graph, I, as I mentioned earlier, the, the distance uh, multigraph of the complete graph, it's the same thing as a complete graph because any two distinct vertices are at distance one. So the adjacent, the distance matrix, it's, uh, the all one, uh, it's all one everywhere except on the diagonal where it's zero. So it's all one minus the identity. And you can calculate its eigenvalues. There are n minus one with multiplicity one. So I put one as an exponent meaning multiplicity and minus one with multiplicity n minus one. So the maximum between, so n plus is one and n minus is n minus one. So that maximum is n minus one. And this proves that the complete graph cannot be addressed with words of uh, uh, length n minus two or, or less. And this is, uh, a result which can be phrased in, uh, in, in terms of uh, biclic partition. And it states that the complete graph uh, cannot be partitioned. The edge set, the edge set of the complete graph on n vertices cannot be partitioned into n minus two or less um, uh, biclics. And in the Graham Pollock paper, they mentioned that this is a result for which they don't know any, any combinatorial proofs. There are several proofs of the result now uh, by Peck, uh, by Tverberg. Um, there is some proof which claims to be a counting proof. It replaces the dimension method by, the, uh, by a pigeonhole principle. Uh, yeah, morally, I think it's still a, it's still a linear, algebraic, uh, linear algebraic proof, but yeah, it depends on how you think about these things. So this gives the lower bound. So again, the linear algebraic is proof, uh, method is proof for the low, it's used for the lower bound. For the upper bound, again, because uh, the, um, determining this n of kn is the same thing as uh, partitioning the uh, the edge set of kn into into biclics. It's a matter of finding constructions, and uh, it's easy to find actually to partition the complete graph on n vertices into n minus one uh, biclics. Perhaps the simplest way is if you have the let's say if you have the graph on uh, four vertices, you can write it as a union of stars. You have that star, and then you can uh, do this star, and then you can do another star at the, at the bottom. But there are many ways, and there's an exercise in the, there was one in the older version of the Baba and Frankel notes. I don't know if you're aware that in March, 2020, there is some new version of the Baba and Frankel. If you Google it, you will find the PDF file. And they have an exercise, I think it was 1.4.5, in which they ask that there are more than two n minus four to the n minus four non-isomorphic decomposition of Kn into n minus one disjoint biclics. It's, I think it's an open problem to determine the exact number. Uh, clearly for n equals four, that's not, uh, that's not the number that gives you one. And there, there, 
there's another one in which you can use, uh, there's another decomposition in which you can use a, a K22 and then you use uh, to one edge at the, at the bottom and one edge at the, uh, at the top and one edge at the bottom. So there are many ways, but uh, yeah, I don't think there is a formula known. Okay. Um, then Graham and Pollock did the trees. So for trees, they actually show that uh, something interesting. They show that uh, this distance matrix of a tree on n vertices, it's determinant, does not depend on the tree. It's always this, this value that I wrote there. And uh, they use some, uh, some, some properties, this result to, to deduce that the, the minimum length of, their, um, of the addressing for a tree, the optimal length is n minus one. And actually you can do the trees, they do a recursive procedure. You can do trees with uh, just uh, words of, you can address them optimally with just words of uh, containing zero and one, no stars. Later on, Graham and, Graham and Lovas also study the um, uh, distance matrix, find a formula for the inverse of the distance matrix and some other things related to its characteristic polynomial. Um, more about the distance matrix, there's a recent paper by Chowdhury and Carr in 2019. There's also a paper I forgot to mention uh, about several authors in which they proved uh, some uh, uh, conjecture about of, of, uh, Graham and Lovas about the coefficients of the characteristic polynomial of the of the of the distance matrix, um, cycles uh, they prove that the optimal length of uh, addressing cycles is uh, n minus one if the cycle is odd and n over two if the cycle is even. And you have there some examples for n equals six and n equals uh, n equals five. So that is uh, done. Um, what they couldn't do was uh, something for general graphs. So in their paper, they have a, this addressing scheme and they get this upper bound that N of G is at most, I think that's something like uh, maybe related to the Wiener index, the sum of all the degrees be between the vertices, which is at most a diameter times N minus one. And later on, uh, Ron Graham conjecture that uh, actually for any graph, n of g should be at most n minus one. And this was became known as uh, Graham's squash cube conjecture and was proved in uh, 1983 by Peter Winkler. Um, so it's a very nice paper. It's also a chapter, uh, it's half of a chapter in uh, the book, A Course in Combinatorics by Van Lint and, uh, and Wilson uh, devoted to, uh, to Winkler's solution to this uh, conjecture. So any graph you can, you can address it with less than n minus one, but you know, determining the smallest value, we, we don't know. Uh, now, I'll, here I'll explain what's the reason about squash cube conjecture. Why is it called a squash cube? Well, the star, whenever you see stars, you can, you can think of it that uh, squashing some part of, of a cube. So for example, you here uh, start at, at, uh, at the cube that you have there in the, in the center of the picture. So it's a three-dimensional cube in which the vertices are labeled as we all know they're labeled by these uh, binary words of uh, length three. And then the first step is to squash that face on the right, which has one in the first position and it has anything on the second and third position. So once you know they do, this is from the, uh, the Graham, one of the Graham and Pollock papers, so you squash that and what that means, it means you create a vertex which, which is denoted by one star star, okay? Then the second step would be you squash the, the edge which is denoted there by uh, the one on the, uh, the left uh, which is denoted by zero one star. That's the edge connecting zero one zero to zero one one. So when you squash that you get the label zero one star and then you leave the other two vertices alone and you end up with, a, with an addressing of the, um, of the K, of K4 in which the, you know, you have basically, you have squashed these four vertices from the C4 into this one star star, you squash two other vertices into zero one star and you left the other two vertices alone. And this is a, a valid uh, address. So that's kind of the, the meaning of this kind of, of this name squashed, uh, squashed cube. I mean, for other graphs, you know, this was uh, known from uh, uh, Graham and Pollock. Then recently you can, you know, ask what do you do for, you know, your favorite graph like Peterson graph. 
And this is a paper in discrete mathematics because the eigenvalue bound uh, gives you five. So the, the Peterson graph, uh, this maximum of the number of positive and negative eigenvalues of the, its distance matrix is five. So you, it means you can you have to to address it with the least five length uh, five. Uh, you know, uh, so these people, uh, David Gregory was one of my advisors. They tried uh, hard to find with five. They couldn't do it. And then they actually found one with six and they they proved they they um, they proved that equality cannot happen in the eigenvalue bound. So the, the this number n for Peterson graph is has to be uh, is strictly greater than five, greater or equal to six. And this is an addressing in which the labels are kind of uh, change. A stands for zero, B stands for one, and zero stands for star. Okay, that's that's again I copied this uh, picture from their from their paper. It's open for other Knazer graphs. I'll tell you in a little bit about other other related graphs, but um, other Knazer graphs outside the complete graphs. Okay, so it's it's you know, finding this optimal addressing is is not known. So I want to talk about some results we did a uh, few years ago, and this includes one of my undergraduate students. So Michelle Markevich, she was an undergraduate uh, at UD, and we wrote this paper with her and some collaborators. She now works at uh, at, at NSA. And so we addressed uh, Hamming graphs, which is perhaps not so surprising that you can find the optimal addressing. What is a Hamming graph? So I won't, I'll just tell you the definition, HDQ. You have an alphabet of size Q, so Q is greater or equal to two, and you have words of length, uh, of length uh, uh, D and two over this alphabet. So two words are adjacent if and only if they differ in exactly one position. So in this, uh, in, in, in my picture, my words would be, I would have uh, three words. So I have zero, 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 one, zero, two. And then I would have one, zero, one, 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 two. And then two, zero, two, one, two, two. And they're adjacent if they're in the same uh, row or in there if they're in the same, uh, in the same uh, column. So I kind of said them the other way around. And so for these graphs, so these graphs HDQ, so you have words X1, XD with each X taking, uh, so you have Q to the D vertices. And you can prove that, perhaps not surprising that the optimal addressing has length D, D times Q minus one. Um, so the lower bound, uh, we can do it in two ways. One way you can actually calculate the distance spectrum of HDQ because these graphs are are uh, distance regular graphs. And so their distance matrices are, um, are polynomials in their adjacency matrix. And so the distance matrix, you can write it in, it, you can write it in a nice way in terms of the adjacency matrix and you can find its eigenvalues. So you can see the, that the distance spectrum has one positive eigenvalue and uh, one negative one, which has multiplicity DQ minus one, which gives the lower bound here. And for the upper bound, we just uh, had some constructions. Um, so that, that addresses the, uh, these graphs. So it's not surprising because again, HDQ, think about it, is, the cart is this box product of K, Q, 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 and each of them you can address it with, with Q minus one uh, symbols from, from Graham and Pollock. And uh, so we, we also looked into, so our results, we have different method that we can deal with um, box product of complete graphs of different sizes. And you can prove, determine the optimal length of their addressing. And we have this uh, result that, uh, you know, if I, if I glue the addressing of G1 together with the addressing of G2 and GL, I will get an addressing of, uh, of, uh, of G. And that gives me the, this upper bound of N on G. And we couldn't find examples where this kind of strange that in inequality is strict. So perhaps that uh, maybe it's not so so hard, but we ha we haven't done it. We found examples where you can we can prove that it's uh, it's equality if each j j is transmission regular, which means that the the distance matrix of uh, each of these graphs uh, has constant uh, uh, row sum, and in addition. The, the minimum the optimal addressing is is attained by the number of negative eigenvalues then we can we can prove it but in general we don't know if there are examples where this is uh, strict inequality okay 
Um, so then we looked at uh, other graphs, which are Johnson graphs. So Johnson graph J and K, uh, the vertex set here are all the K subsets of, uh, of a set with N elements. And you have A is adjacent to B if and only if uh, the intersection between A and B is size K minus one. So they differ in, uh, in one, one element. And uh, you know they're very well studied graphs in uh, in, in in graph theory and algebraic graph theory and so on. Um, and you you know their eigenvalues. They're given by this. We, they can be calculated, and um, in general, they're given by these Eberlein polynomials and so on. And for the distance spectrum, you can you can uh, calculate it. It was done by uh, Atik and Panigrani Rahi in 2015, but it also appears in a paper by Kulen and Spektorov very nice paper in 1994 in which they were uh, classified all distance regular graph whose distance uh, matrix has uh, exactly one positive one positive eigenvalue. And so you can uh, get these eigenvalues and you see again the same situation, one positive eigenvalue of the distance matrix uh, of multiplicity one and one negative of multiplicity n minus one. So the eigenvalue bound for this graph gives you n minus one. And in our paper, we could nudge it a little bit and you can improve the bound. You can show that equality doesn't happen, and so the lower bound is at least at least n. But we had no idea about upper bound. And then I gave this problem to another undergraduate. So uh, here, this is a picture taken in uh, fall of uh, 2019, so a year and so ago. Uh, so Noga is now at Princeton, and he came to uh, give a colloquium in our department. And so I uh, was there with uh, him and uh, Brendan Gilbert is, uh, is the undergraduate who worked with us on this problem. And another undergraduate uh, from Singapore, Zhao Kuang Tan, who worked with, uh, with me on a, on a different problem. So we, we studied the, the Johnson graphs and I wanna tell you now about the ideas of the undergraduate of Brendan Gilbert, because it's really nice. So we could find a, an upper bound. So in this, we have it in this paper and in, uh, so Brendan wrote a senior thesis about this, uh, that you can address the Johnson graph with uh, words of length k times n minus k. And these are kind of, again, I took snapshots from the paper and to do the addressing, I'll go quickly through it. And it's, it's quite, uh, uh, it, it, it's not as the simplest addressing scheme that, uh, that you've seen. You define a function from the k subsets from the vertices of the Johnson graph to this Cartesian product between uh, of um, the complement of uh, k and k, so that's where you this function, uh, you know the you know we, that that uh, Cartesian product has cardinality k times n minus k, and the way you define it is if you take a set S which is the same as k, then the, func the function outputs the empty set. Otherwise, if S is not k, then you put in one part. The, in A, you put the elements that S has that K doesn't, so the ones that are bigger than K, and you order them decreasingly, X1, X2, Xt2, uh, uh, as you see there. And in B, you put uh, things that K has and S doesn't, and they're also, because both um, uh, K and S have cardinality K, they're also gonna be T elements there, and you order them increasingly. And then f of s is going to output this kind of extreme type of card, uh, order pairs. You pair up the largest x1 with the smallest y1, and so on. So you have an example example there. Um, so then the addressing scheme goes as follows. It's an algorithm that uh, Brendan came up with. So you basically uh, you input the vert the vertex s, which is a k subset, and then uh, basically, the the uh, the letters in the in the word the word is this a of s um, of uh, associated with s are indexed by these pairs x y and uh, where x comes from uh, the the large the the complement of of k in n and y comes from k. And it's done by this uh, this procedure, which yeah, uh, if you've seen it first time, it's uh, it's not the easiest one to parse. Um, essentially, what what Brendan did, he ran, he did computations for these parameters for this uh, optimal addressing, 
and he, he, his program would always give him this value k times n minus k for small values. And then he basically reverse engineer the, this is the algorithm that he came up with that produces his, uh, his, his, his computation. And then we prove that this is actually an optimal, uh, an optimal addressing. And I can give you, I mean, it's not, uh, again, you know, I'm uh, throwing a lot of uh, information at you all at once, but essentially you, you basically, you have, for example, here when n is six and, uh, and k is three, you, the the letters in these words are indexed by these pairs four one four five one six one and so on. There are nine nine such order pairs, and for each order pair, for uh, and for each uh, vertex set here, like one two three, uh, you apply the algorithm from before and you 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 come up with each each uh, each letter. So zero exponent two means that uh, that letter is zero because we ended up applying the second part of the previous algorithm and so on. So the output is all on the right. You get, uh, you get this, uh, um, these addresses of length n for any length nine for the Johnson graph J663. Um, so the end, again, I'm not gonna go through it. We proved that this, uh, this is correct. This gives an optimal addressing. Okay, how good is it? Well, when k equals one, j n one is the complete graph, so it gives you n minus one, which is okay, which is correct. K equals two, we did it by computer, um, and we proved that it's correct for n equals four, five, six. Uh, you know, you have some of these graphs here. You know, uh, j four two six vertices, j five two, it's a complement of Peterson, is ten vertices, j six two is fifteen, and then it kind of stop at uh, uh, j seven two. We don't know what happens after that. Um, also, it's not our construction, it's not sharp in general, because uh, we, when we started working with Brendan Mackay, also on this, uh, on this paper, he ran a, did a computer, uh, his algorithm gave us uh, an addressing of J63 of length nine. So you have a lower bound for this uh, Johnson graphs, you have a lower bound of N, and you have an upper bound of K times N minus K. So I don't know what the optimal, uh, optimal value is. Now, in the paper, also we looked at, um, and this uh, we looked at the uh, addressing random graphs. So this is a, a quote from a survey of Rom Graham in uh, 1988. Uh, R of G, it's the same as our parameter N of G. He did not in that paper by R of G, and he uh, asks this, is, makes this statement that you know we don't know how it behaves in random graphs, but maybe perhaps it's natural to guess that it should equal uh, you know number of vertices in the graph minus one for almost all large graphs. So remember that Peter Winkler proved that this R of G is always at most the number of vertices of in the graph minus one. And now Ron would guess that that's the case for most of the graphs. So we, uh, with uh, Brandon and, you know, he learned uh, Naughty and uh, the, you know, the Brandon Mackay's uh, computer program and so on. And he did the computations, I think up to N vertices and so on. So you see the N is the first column, then, f of n is a, a collection of all uh, connected graphs on n vertices and labeled. So when you have two vertices, you have uh, one, one graph, three vertices, you have two graphs and so on. It grows quite fast. And then it's a distribution of this parameter. So you see like when n equals four, um, you have the you know, graph on four vertices and it's only the cycle C4 that has an optimal addressing with of length two. So that's why you have that, that one over there. And the same thing, if you go at eight, you know, it's, it's this one over there. It's because that's the cube of, uh, you know, three dimensional cube. And then what we notice is that it's not the last column of N minus one that is the largest. It seems like there's a lot of power in the other, in the other column. And for the largest, for n equals 10, this is what Brendan Mackay did. He did the computation, you know, there are many graphs, too many graphs. So he picked uh, one, uh, you know, a, a chunk of them. And, uh, you know, again, he obtained this distribution. And again, it's not this one that's the largest. There are some, some other ones there. So what's going on? And this is essentially, I mean, I remember this from a while ago that uh, through, I think Xing Peng, who was uh, your your uh, student at the University of South Carolina, but an argument of uh, of uh, of Alon, 
And basically Noga alone in, uh, you know, uh, gave a proof that for almost all graphs, you can uh, addressing is, is, is a way, so kind of it answers negatively Graham question. It's not gonna be N minus one. It moves away from, from N minus one by, by something. And the argument, I'll just sketch it here, is that you, you pick a K, which is about uh, two times log N, a little bit less. And uh, from previous work of, uh, of Noga alone, um, the, the graph GN05 uh, almost surely contains any copy of a graph on K vertices. And the graph that he's interested in is, is like a grid. Uh, I mean, you can take a, a grid which has like square root of k, square root of k, like this, like the the Hamming graph that I was talking to you about earlier, and uh, so you have k vertices there, and you have n minus k vertices here, and now on this square root grid, square root of k with square root of k, the distance between the vertices are zero, are one or two, and in the random graph also the the distances are going to be just uh, just one and two. And in here, we can cover all the edges using roughly two square root k of edges, a uh, two square root of k uh, uh, by clicks. And then here, for the rest of the, the edges in this distance multigraph, we use about n minus k plus one uh, by clicks. So at the end, we get we end up with a with an upper bound of of the form um, n of g less or equal than n minus k plus one plus two square root of k where k is about two times log in base two of n. And that's exactly the, the bound over there. Now, this is a problem that's still open. What's the behavior of this parameter for, for random graphs? Uh, for lower bound, the only thing that I know is you can use this uh, Wigner semicircle law and so on with uh, eigenvalues. And you have about n over two eigenvalues that are positive and negative, and then you you get that the lower bound is n over two minus lower terms. So, you know, findings, you know, is this n of g uh, closer to the lower bound or to upper bound? Uh, nobody knows. There's related research on the biclic partition of the random graphs in the realm g and p. Um, but so the difference between them is that in the biclic partition, you have a random graph and you are trying to minimize the number of biclicks that partition the edge set of that graph. In the addressing partition, n of g is the minimum uh, uh, number of biclicks that decompose not the graph itself, but its distance multigraph. Now, the random graph has diameter two, almost surely. So its distance multigraph, it's gonna be what? It's gonna be the graph itself plus tw twice the complement. And when you turn it around, it's just gonna be a complete graph on which you put, on which you put a random graph on top of it. And uh, yeah, that seems to, I'm not an expert in random graphs uh, by any means, but that seems to, to mess things up. And the results are perhaps less stronger than in the realm of biclic partition of random graphs, where there are all these works of Alon, um, Fan Chang and uh, Sam Peng, Alon Bowman and uh, Huang and so on. Now, I'll give you another question that it's uh, wide open. Um, it's a graph for which the values are far apart. And this is the cocktail party graph. So this is a complement of, uh, of a matching on M edges, which I denote by MM in a, in a complete graph on two M uh, vertices. And this originates in a problem in geometry about uh, packing boxes such that they touch in a certain dimension uh, due to Zucks. And he came up with these constructions, uh, like some recursive construction of order 3m over 2. And uh, in, the, in the initial paper, he used the eigenvalue uh, bound to get the bound of m plus 1 or something like that. And uh, later on, Hoffman improved that bound to, to this value over here. But uh, still, there is a huge gap, huge gap between them. The problem here is that the eigenvalue bound is is, uh, is not close to the construction because these graphs, K2M minus M has many zero eigenvalues. And so this maximum between M plus and M minus one is actually M plus one. And then Hoffman did this uh, amazing result to actually improve it by square root of 2M, but it's still, it's a big gap uh, between them. I think when 
about 10 years ago when uh, this is a problem I gave Mike uh, Mike Tate to start uh, you know doing research and so on and I think at that time he had managed to prove that the upper bound gives the right uh, value for for several small values of m but again this is still uh, wide open okay um, so I talk, I said about graphs and hypergraphs. So let me deal with hypergraphs. Well, addressing for hypergraphs, I, I mentioned in the title is addressing graph and hypergraphs. This problem of addressing hypergraphs, I don't know any of it, but uh, like motiva again, motivated by this bi-click partition and decomposition, you can study a similar problem for, for hypergraphs. And we can phrase it as follows. FRN is the minimum number of complete R part tight, R uniform uh, hypergraphs that partition the edge set of, um, so uh, K and R, so uh, K and R, the vertex set has cardinality N and the edge set uh, has cardinality N choose R. And when uh, like FRN, we're looking at partitioning all these uh, uh, edge, uh, hyper edges into complete R partite R uniform hypergraphs. So for example, when R equals three, our complete uh, three partite three uniform, you have three uh, uh, pairwise disjoint subsets and you take all the triples that have one, one endpoint in each of them. You take all of them and you wanna ask the question, what is the minimum number of such things that partition the, the edge set of, uh, of the hypergraph? And this is a, a paper in, I guess, the second edition of graphs and combinatorics. And so, as mentioned earlier in the previous slide, the Graham and Pollock theorem is that F2n is n minus one. And Noga alone proved that F3n is also n minus two. So it's linear, F2n and F3n are linear. But after that, they're no linear. And actually FRn is essentially like of order of magnitude n to the power r over two, floor of, uh, of r over two. And you know this is the, the abstract of his paper. So his uh, lower bound use essentially a hypergraph version of the Tverber proof, like come up with some system of linear equations and so on. And his upper bound was a recursive, recursive construction. Um, so his lower bound gave this value of, which I wrote there later on with, uh, under Kungen and Jacques Verstrati, we, we improved the bound, but not in, uh, in the order, like the largest term, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, in, in terms of this n to the k, uh, it's still the coefficient in front of it, it's, it's the same as, uh, as from, uh, from Nova, but with perhaps a simpler proof using, um, reducing the problem to a biclic decomposition, relating it to a de biclic decomposition of Knazer graphs, and this is the best lower bound that is known so far. So you know, I don't know any improvement of this, uh, of the lower bound. It's all linear algebraic. Um, for the construction side, uh, like I said, Nogalon gave a construction with um, uh, recursive. You can give, we give in our paper a simple construction of uh, F2K being uh, N minus K choose K. And later on with Mike, we managed to cut off some of it, but again, we couldn't cut off anything in and and to the uh, uh, to the power k. So in general, you can think of it as frn is being less than or equal than one plus little o of, of uh, one times n choose uh, this uh, r over two. But uh, recently, uh, Imre Leder um, and his students and collaborators, they managed to make progress and improve the upper bound. So the upper bound, they improved it for every even. They basically, the coefficient in front went from one to 14 over 15. And they looked at, um, in general, what's the, you know, the coefficient that you can put in front there so you can have an inequality of this form, FRN less than CR times N choose R. They make some, they prove some other results about this, uh, these uh, parameters. Um, so, you know they have some some very nice very nice results. I won't go through them uh, here. Uh, just to mention that the construction is kind of like a lone recursive construction, but they make an improvement in a certain in a certain uh, place when they decompose Cartesian products of uh, edge sets of complete graphs 
into Cartesian products of uh, edge set of complete bipartite graphs in a, in, in a better way. So again, it's not known. F for N, for example, it's between uh, um, 14 over 15 uh, N choose two. And on the other side, I think is N choose two divided by three. So it's a big, uh, big gap, uh, you know, one over three versus 14 over 15. Okay. Um, so there are many variations. So I'll just mention a few. Um, you can switch again, motivated by work of Zucks in geometry. Uh, you can switch the problem a little bit to say, okay, BP12 of Kn, minimum number of biclics that cover the edges of Kn such that each edge is covered once or twice. So if you want to cover exactly once, uh, N minus one is the best you can. But if you want to cover once or twice, it turns out you can do it with two times square root of N. And the linear algebraic method of uh, a bound of Huang and Surakov, it gives you a lower bound of square root of N minus one. But I don't know what's the exact value of this. Uh, again, I think with Mike, we looked at this problem and uh, at least for small values of N, the upper bound was the right one. Um, yes, but I don't know how, what's, what would be the, the exact value in general. And you, again, in the paper with Mike, we studied uh, this parameter for other lists. You can do BP13, which is the minimum number of biclics that partition the edge set of Kn such that every edge is covered once or three times. And this one, it turns out to be linear. It's between N over two and four N over seven. But you can, you know, one, two, four behaves in a different way. It's in term, it's order of magnitude is square root of n. Now, if you want to, uh, like uh, the the simplest set would be uh, a, a list of with just one element. So in that case, you look at this parameter BP lambda kn, which is the minimum number of biclics that partition the edge set of a com uh, uh, that cover the edge set of the complete graph such that each edge is covered exactly lambda times. And this, there's a conjecture of Decain, uh, Gregory and Pritikin from 93 that if you fix lambda, then for n large enough, this value equals n minus one. And I think they proved it for la lambda, I forgot most a certain uh, small value. And recently, Rohatgi, Urschel and Wellens prove an asymptotic version of it. And they prove that if you fix lambda, BP lambda is gonna be one plus little low of, of n. So you cannot do n minus one, but uh, still, this is a very, very nice result. Um, directed graphs, there's not much known there. For directed graphs, you can play this addressing game in which uh, you have to, when you count uh, the, the position in the addresses, you want to count just the, the distance. You want that the distance in, the, in your digraph between x and y to be the number of position in which X has a zero and Y has a one. So for this one is less work. I remember about um, the SIAM meeting in 2012 or something in Halifax, I gave a talk about these results. And so something that both Fan Chung and Ron Graham who said that nobody has done much progress on this question since, since their work. So yeah, this would be uh, again, another interesting project to see if uh, one can do more about these directed graphs. Um, I'm almost done, I'm gonna, Save. So this is kind of a tribute to uh, Ron Graham and many of his contributions. There's several very nice papers about his work and so on. Um, so again, the Graham-Pollock theorem is my favorite result, perhaps in uh, in, in graph theory. This um, you know the fact that you cannot partition it in uh, fewer than um, n minus two or fewer uh, by clicks. Um, there is a nice refinement of this result in a paper by Alon, Broaldi and Shader in 91. And they proved that in any partition, you remember, we don't know how many there are, that's the, the Babai Frankel uh, exercise. In any partition into n minus one biclics, you can pick one edge from each biclic such that you get a tree. That's really an, a nice result. And there is a conjecture, which I think is still open of uh, Dom de Cain, that actually you can find a path um, so you can convince yourself in those pictures that you can find a path of uh, green, blue, and uh, and red. But uh, yeah, this is not known in general. Okay, so I'm I'm gonna stop here. That's uh, everything I had to say. Thank you again for for your attention. Thank you, Sebi. If we could all thank our speaker in some way, uh, either in the chat or or 
Uh, Ava's got the little uh, clap emoji there. Then uh, we'll open it up for some questions. Thank you. I, I got a quick question for you. Yeah. Um, that uh, the question about FR over N twos or over two. Uh huh. Um, is it known to converge? No. So no. I mean, there is a monotonicity. A very simple thing about um, uh, like you know F three N and F two N minus one something like that, because if I have a decomposition of uh, the bigger one into triples, I just delete the part whenever I have N in one color class, I just throw that away. And that gives me a bi-click decomposition in the, in the lower thing. And that's about it. I mean, other than that, I don't know other, um, you know, like the Turan numbers, you have this thing with the Turan densities that you can, you know, count here and so on. And you get this, uh, these limits and so on. I don't know if, uh, yeah, I don't think it's known for, for this problem. And the same thing for the other one, like I said, BP12 is at most two square root of N and it's at least the square root of N minus one. I don't think it's known if it, uh, the, the ratio of that by square root of N, if it converges to anything, I, yeah. Yeah, that one seems harder to the uh, FR over M two Z over two. You might yeah some some additivity or something in both. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Good. Good Do we have any other questions for our speaker? Um, so I might have missed this, um, but yeah. back on that table where you uh, you click or you you look through all the graphs on small mm -hmm. uh, numbers of vertices. Uh, was there some intuition as to why it was, I think there was a conjecture given on maybe where the center would be, but was there, is there some, uh, I don't know, motivate or not motivation, but is there some reasoning as to why you could think that would be the case or, or. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, that's a good point. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, this quote is from Ron Graham's, uh, you know, uh, paper. Uh, unfortunately, I never asked him about this, and you know, I think he read that. But you know, uh, Winkler proved that you can always R of G is at most uh, number of vertices minus one, and actually, his scheme gives you n minus one. Mm -hmm. um, then I don't know. I mean, uh, yeah. Uh, you know, what would be your guess about uh, this parameter? How, you know, like, <laughs> what does it measure? You know what I mean? Like when it's small, like you see it over there, like when n equals eight, it's the smallest value is three. It's always like this n of g, I didn't mention, it's always at least log in base two of n or something like that. And so in that situation, your graph is kind of like the cube. So with the cube, it's very nice and so on, but the random graph is not, is not that nice. So maybe as, you know the, on um, you know the values for the random graph should be on the other side of uh, of log two n. But mm. yeah, I mean I don't have any in, like intuition and so on about you know what is the exact value. I'm, you know. Uh, okay, I mean it's just it's just very interesting data. I was. <laughs> yeah, know. I mean the, this is I mean you know it kind of like more practical thing. You have a student and you give them projects. This came up okay. <laughs> This is a easy excuse for 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 the student to learn uh, <laughs> naughty. Go cal calculate these things, and then when we got stuck, uh, I was like, okay, I, we can email a Brendan Mackay, and uh, he became interested and could push his push this a little bit. <laughs> sure. But that's a, the other thing is that for this small, they're useful because they gave us the intuition that is not n minus one, mm -hmm. but it doesn't give you an intuition of what what in the world happens for large gen? I mean, I don't, you know? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks. Any other questions?
Okay. In that case, thanks again, Sebi. Uh, thank you thank very everybody much. for, for thank making you. it out and uh, have a good weekend. Thank everybody. you. Thanks. Bye-bye.